So I'd like to thank Ginny for coming to speak to us today. So um, Professor Ginny Barber is uh, based at Queensland University of Technology. Um, she's the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group um, and has also been a member of the FAIR Australia Working Group, um, which I think you'll probably talk about both of those a little bit today. Um, and previously, uh, you were based at, the, at PLOS, the Public Library of Science, um, working in medicine and biology areas. Um, so uh, I guess um, we can, as you suggested, we should sort of go around the table and introduce ourselves. So um, I'll just say that this is a, so Emble Australia Bioinformatics Resource uh, Special Interest Group. And this special interest group is in open science. So um, the Emble Australia Bioinformatics Resource is a distributed uh, network around Australia. And we all are interested in bioinformatics, but based around certain key areas. And this is in data and tools and compute and training and platforms that underpin all of those things. Um, so we, we have... 12 nodes around the country um, and yes we, so we have these key areas and we, we also have the, the plan to have special interest groups so this open science special interest group is the first uh, special interest group we have um, and really I guess most of what Emble ABR do is we kind of call ourselves a coalition of the willing um, we're generally not funded um, we're, we're all personally interested in open science um, and uh, previously at all hands meetings where all the nodes got together it was, this, it was uh, agreed that certainly on open science and an open science special interest group would be something that would be, be of, uh, worth having. Um, so I can talk about myself first but maybe or last, um, I don't know, Philip, Philip do you want to say a few words about your particular interest in open science. Hi, um, I'm Philip. I'm sitting at UWA in Perth. Um, I'm a postdoc here working in plant genomics and plant breeding. And I'm also the co-founder of OpenSNP, which is a web platform for customers of direct-to-consumer genotyping companies like 23andMe to um, share their data with the public and annotate with phenotypes. And from these two areas, I'm also my, comes my interest in open science because I think we should share more of our research and our data and find interest to just to do so better and easier. That's it. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Matt? Hi. I'm pleased to report the fire alarm is over. So it's <laughs> a bit more easy to think here. Uh, I'm based at the Walsh and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. And we develop a lot of open source software tools for bioinformatics analysis. Uh, they're available through the Bioconductor project. And we're always keen to uh, teach people how to use our tools and, uh, and develop them further so that they continue to be useful for mostly gene expression analysis, but other, other applications as well. Okay, great. And uh, my history, I guess, is in uh, building public repositories and tools for analyzing certain types of biological data, so gene expression data, and um, you know, making the tools and the data open or connected um, and accessible and interoperable are uh, all the things that uh, interest me personally. Um, yeah, so, and I, I so I was lucky enough to hear Ginny speak um, recently, and I think uh, I, I'm sure you'll talk about this. But the the sort of the uh, terminology of open to fair and various things all in between, I think, is is an interesting thing to discuss. So um, yeah, so that's probably enough from us for the, for now. So I'll hand over to Ginny. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Let me just uh, share my screen. I'm sure, we can do this. Second. Okay. 
Okay, hopefully you're seeing my, um, my slide presentation there. Very good. So, um, well, thanks for the uh, a chance to come and talk to you. Um, and, and thanks very much for the invitation, Jeff. Um, let me just, I'll give you a little bit, a little, little bit more about me. So um, I feel like I have been talking about open access for ages, and that's probably because I have. Um, I actually, my background's in medicine and science, and then I worked at The Lancet for five years as an editor there. Saw the light when I realised that Elsevier wasn't that interested in um, uh, open access, and that was probably still the case. Um, and uh, was went off to start plus medicine at the Public Library of Science back in 2004. So I've, I've sort of been involved in open access for quite some time. Um, and I guess one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in trying to take a different approach is that, you know, here we are 15 years later and uh, we still don't have this fully open access world. And um, a lot of people are trying to approach it from a sort of different angle now. So I'm going to talk, I'm basically going to pretty much give the talk that I talk, gave at um, uh, e-research uh, so it's about 15 minutes 15 20 minutes but i'll give a little bit of background to the group as well so um I, you can tell i'm not australian um i moved from the uk about four years ago and I, when i moved here i was actually still working for plos um and the a job came up which was working for a group called the australasian open access strategy group uh which essentially uh is a it is actually very much a coalition of the willing. So I think, I think, I, I think I'm going to use that term. Sometimes it's the unwilling, but mostly it's a coalition of the willing. Um, and it came out of a group of, uh, there's an organisation called the Council of Australian University Librarians, uh, which is the sort of peak body for librarians here. And a group of those um, librarians and um, other associated sort of senior executives felt they wanted to be able to advocate for open access on a, a sort of more global scale. And at that time, and I think, you know, probably still now, there's a range of opinions about open access, its, its importance and, um, you know, what should be done around it. And so this group was founded to act as an advocacy group that was a sort of separate to the Council of University Librarians. Um, if you're familiar with organisations like Spark, which is the Scholarly Publishing Academic Resources Coalition, which had the Joseph heads, um, it's kind of a bit like Spark, um, and they have a similar relationship to their uh, university librarians group. Um, so we are uh, supported by 11 institutions in Australia, and then the Council of uh, New Zealand University Librarians as a body. So I'm pleased to say that UWA is part of it, um, and Jill Ben, who is um, the University Librarian, is is very very much involved with the Fair Initiative as well. So if you, Philip, if you want to get more interest in that, I would strongly suggest you actually, you know, perhaps ha have a chat with her or, or uh, go and find out um, what's going on there. Um, and Melbourne University of Melbourne is also a member. We don't. Um, we haven't got sort of smaller members such as we high but we'd like to have more members but at the moment this is the group that that supports us and uh it works that i i, I work for it well three days a week and we have an administrative assistant so it's a small a very small group um and so we sort of do what we can within those confines and i guess that we have um when we originally started the group was actually called the uh, Australian Open Access Support Group. So we've expanded to be Australia, Australasian. Um, we've also expanded to include organisations like Creative Commons Australia and New Zealand, which are really important in this space, actually, because they, the, the, the work that they do around licences is, is really key to moving beyond the concept of open access just as a free-to-read PDF, which is what you, you know, a lot of people still think equates with open access, really. Um, so we have good relationships with them. Creative Commons Australia is also based at QUT and uh, Creative Commons New Zealand folk are doing lots of good stuff. Um, so that's that's the group. And then this is sort of us on the on the web, as it were. This is really our public facing thing. Um, uh, if you're wondering why, Bar why Barnaby Joyce is on the front page of is, is on my slide, it's because uh, I wrote a short piece last week. Uh, which got into the conversation it's this little one down here which says not just available but we have but um uh, but open and how we might move beyond just the concept of uh, making things available as a as the end goal of open access and came out the same day that barnaby got uh, booted out of the senate so um or out of the house so we kind of got bumped down the page but there you go um so we do this this is kind of our public face we do a lot of stuff around trying to raise the profile of open access having it in front of everybody as much as we can so website you know usual stuff uh twitter is probably our most effective uh mechanism i would say 
um, and the website we try to use as a source of definitive information as much as possible. Um, we also do things like we put consultations into government uh, inquiries, so we did five this year, so you know, if anyone of you have done those consult consultations, that's quite a lot of work, I mean it takes a fair bit of time to do something that's actually um, reasonably well thought through, but we think that's probably a useful use of our time. We spend time talking to the ARC and the NH and MRC about their policies and I think probably as part as a result of our lobbying the um, new ARC policy and probably and I believe the new NH and MRC one will include include language about licenses for the first time which they haven't done in the past so that's been good um, and we also uh, convene uh, we do things such as communities of practice. We have a uh, one that we run for Australia and New Zealand, and we uh, do a sort of lot of outreach generally. I give lots lots of talks, so that all goes without saying. All of this stuff's freely available, and you know, you're very welcome to uh, uh, take it and use it. Um, so, why? What I, I I'm I'm going to give you two slides to kind of sort of talk about why where we are right now, and 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 then sort of move on to the approach we're taking. So. Um, I think it's fair to say that probably for the first 10 years of open access, um, not a lot happened, certainly for the first five years. Most people thought we were a bit irritating and kind of a bit, you know, sort of something on the sides and nobody paid very much attention. Um, the, some of the big publishers tried to under, undermine us, and, um, but not, not really very much happened. And I think it was probably from about 2012, probably, when things really started to heat up. Um, and the pace of change since then has just been enormous. I mean, I, I pretty much every time I um, give this talk, and I you know, often give it every couple of weeks, I update this slide. But just some really, really big things that are happening globally that I think are worth uh, talking about. So the, there are some very big organisations behind the changes now. So the European Union is absolutely on board with open access, no question about it. It is an absolute pillar of their, um, of their uh, working nowadays. Um, the, it's being driven by the Wellcome Trust obviously has been really critical and they are doing some things such as um, launching, well they have launched a new publishing platform because they're so frustrated with the publishers not delivering the open access that they want. Um, sort of subsequent to that but also kind of coming from a slightly different angle as well is the Open Research Funders Group which is essentially the big, uh, the, the big money in the US, the big private money that funds research in the US has decided that they're fed up with uh, all of this thing that's happening and Spark has convened a group called the Open Research Funders Group. Um, it's, you know, with massive, massive amounts of money and, and uh, heft behind it and they are beginning to lay out what their expectations are for um, the work that they fund but they're also coming up with policies that, model policies that can be adopted and I think that's probably going to be a bit of a game changer really. Um, we're also seeing things such as, uh, you know, as big negotiations are happening with publishers, frustration with the publishers and cancellation of journal subscriptions and uh, editors going on strike and coming up with new models and such like. So that's also pretty interesting. Um, so there's a, a bit of an upswell of um, academic uh, uh, um, action. And, you know, for example, in Finland, there's a boycott going on right now at the moment. And then there's some other sort of big things. So the U in the US, there is a uh, act being reintroduced into Congress. And um, I used to say, well, until a couple of weeks ago, I said this was a fantastic example of being able to work in a bipartisan way. But, um, and you know, God, if anyone can work in a bipartisan way in the current Congress, they're doing pretty well. But uh, what actually, unfortunately, seems to have happened is that um, this has been uh, taken over by one of the Republicans and uh, put into another set of lang another another act of congress so unfortunately heather's heather joseph's latest act may actually die because it's been appropriated into something else which is pretty frustrating for her um really but but what you see is that this kind of incremental change that's happening constantly having the, the language in front of policymakers, etc um and then there's quite a lot of work going on in the uk around a scholarly national scholarly license and i'll talk about that right at the end because that's that again is a potential game changer so these are just really some highlights i could fill this you know 20 times over if you i don't know if you uh, subscribe to something called the open access tracking project which sends out emails every day it's a crowdsourced list of information on open access you know you could get 30 emails a day on things that are happening it's hugely active 
Um, and then things that are happening here, well, these are, uh, there's some real notable ones that are happening. So uh, we have to credit, we should credit the, um, the uh, federal government with this policy, public data policy statement that came out in 2015, which required public data to be available for the CC license unless there was a specific reason to opt out. And this came out of the uh, Office of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. So that's pretty exciting. Um, as you, I'm sure you'll be familiar with, the, there's a National Science and Innovation Agenda, but apparently every Prime Minister has some sort of innovation agenda or launch at some point in their uh, career. So this was the iteration under Malcolm Turnbull. Um, some things that actually have been quite concrete, though, are there's a, uh, Australia is the first university, first, um, country to have a or national orchid consortium so that's really important and that came out of Linda O'Brien who was the previous chair of the working group on FAIR um, who's one of the pro who's a pro vice chancellor at Griffith University who really said well if we're going to get behind this there's no point each individual university doing something differently we need to think about it um, uh, globe, uh, on a sort of national scale and she really brought it to uh, fruition in about a year which is pretty amazing actually um, it's a great example of how you know doing the right thing at the right time can be really really easy doing doing it at the wrong time is really hard but you know it was the right time when universities were beginning to think about it we're beginning to put a bit, bit of money behind it um and you know we're willing to sort of be coordinated um uh new zealand is doing a similar thing um, probably the most important thing I think potentially for policy is uh, the Productivity uh, Commission inquiry into intellectual property arrangements, which you may have heard an awful lot about with regard to things like fair use. And there were lots of um, uh, things in there about rights, improving access to information for, for example, in relation to disability. That got a lot of the high press. But the really interesting bit that I thought was fascinating was that they actually recommended an, a national and state's territories open access policy well actually what they recommended was one for each so which actually makes me feel slightly sick because the thought of having seven open access policies or however many states plus a national one is just too horrific to to bear so our fervent hope when the australian government supported this recommendation is that they will move ahead with one national open access policy and our we believe that that's being managed by the Department of Education at the moment, the Federal Department of Education, and we're sort of in touch with them. Um, then obviously the Productivity Commission did various things with regards to data. The National Science Statement has notes the OA policy, um, and we know that the ARC and NH and MRC are indeed reviewing their own policies. So there's quite a lot going on in this space. Um, a lot of it's behind the scenes, um, and I guess that one of the things that we see as really critical is to try and get the right language into these policies. So whenever they come up is to, is to make sure that whoever's drafting them or talking about them, uh, here's what we, we actually want them to put in rather than something that is, uh, you know, that not, not, not the right language, because we know that that can cause huge problems down the line. Uh, okay, so that's where we are. So, which kind of leads me on to why we've taken the FAIR approach. And so this is a sort of bit of an existential question, but what is open access? So if you, if you were to ask most academics sitting in a room what open access is, they'll say, well, well, first of all, uh, I don't need open access because I can get access to everything I need. Thanks very much because I'm in a university. That's a pretty common response. Um, or if I can't get it through open access, I can, through my library, I, there's Sci-Hub nowadays, which I can go to. I really can get it. Um, people will say things like, well, it's, um, I think open access is a great idea, but I can't afford it because it's really expensive or uh, it's associated with journals I'm not so sure about. Um, and rarely do we think about what the components of open access are. So if you go back to 15 years ago, which was when the Budapest open access uh, declaration was done, that was probably, I think, the most useful definition of open access. It, they talk about, uh, there's a few components of it. So it is free access, it's obviously free access. Um, the ability to read something but it is also it's more than that it's, it has a, really really critically it has reuse rights associated with it um, and author attribution rights and those are enshrined uh, in licenses uh, creative commons and then the last bit really is the permanent archiving so those are the kind of the core components of open access and if you don't have the reuse rights and the author attribution rights you have, you have situations where people say well as happened during OA week the Royal Society said um, for open access, we, we're going to make all of our back content available, freely available, which sounds terribly generous, except you realize it's freely available for one week. 
well that's kind of not open access that's you know it's kind of like we'll have a have a few uh kind of crumbs from the table as it were and of course were you to try and do something with those you would actually end up potentially in quite some problems um, and then the other issue is the permanent archiving. If we don't have good archiving of open access content, then of course it can disappear completely. And we, we've, we've all seen examples of that. So those are the ways that we try and talk about and we're uh, trying to get people to think about what the issues are. And, you know, as I said, you know, here we are 15 years later, probably about 15 to 20% of the uh, academic literature is, is fully open access by those definitions. It's, it's interesting that it of itself it's really hard to uh, try and figure this figure out um, but this is probably about right um, and it belies the issue that we know that you can actually get quite a lot of it illegally available but that's not doesn't mean that you can actually do anything with that other than perhaps get a pdf you can read so i'm trying to talk about it in this that way which is that we we sort of want to be doing better than thinking about you know what is it the publishers are just going to let us do and so i have this vision that we have this global scholarly ecosystem that's fully interconnected um, we'll have we'll, we'll hopefully see a variety of publishing models um, uh, we'll have really sophisticated linking we'll have interoperable research art, art, articles and other outputs and they'll all be uh, linked together including with the relevant data and software and if you think about it you know we're quite a long way away from that right now i would say in any meaningful format so what are the bits that we need to do to try and make that happen okay so so this is where we um came to the idea that we needed to think beyond open so as i said you know open is often equated with just free huge variable adoption um, even people that ought to know better don't talk about open access in the right way and the infrastructure is really really piecemeal and actually if i were to say there was one uh, bit that is absolutely not in place at the moment. It's this the la over, over the overarching uh, infrastructure. Uh, so now for the group that I work for, um, we primarily focus on research articles, but I also do use the term research outputs. We don't talk about data so much, although I work pretty closely with us with um, uh, various people at the Australian National Data Service. So all the stuff that I do, you know, we, we kind of talk across them, but it's primarily we're talking here about research what we consider with traditional research outputs um, but also i tend to include in things like in that things like preprints and you know sort of associated journal articles of, of different sorts um, when we were thinking about this early on one of the things that came out really clearly is we have to um, be able to uh, take this across a wide range of models you know what works for the humanities is not the same as works for physics um, it's really important that we think about what the incentive structures are associated with this. Um, and I think that's uh, an area where there's a lot more work needs to be done um, when we need uh, appropriate infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's, if you're talking about trying to change behavior at all sort of levels, it has to be easier to do this than not. Right now, you know, if you want to make something open access and you're not uh, sitting in an organization where it's very well supported or you have a particular you know, there's a particular way of doing it that's really easy. It's actually really hard. I mean, I had a, uh, I'll tell you a story about, um, I was trying to submit something to the um, uh, repository at QUT where I'm based. And um, actually I was kind of having a stupid afternoon and I couldn't figure out what version of the DIY they wanted, whether they wanted it with the, you know, the full web address or it was just the short address and whatever. And uh, anyway, I, I eventually figured it out got home and told my husband about it my husband's an academic at uq who's published a huge amount um, and first of all he looked completely blank and then he, he said what's a doi so he didn't know what the doi was and there was absolutely no way that he would have spent any time doing that and that's what we hear time and time again from academics they just do not have the time to do this i mean it's not it's you know there's a reason why um, things such as researchgate and academia.edu are being adopted is because they make it really easy for people to opt in and i think that's something that universities just have not kind of cottoned on to yet um, so the the approach that we're taking is fair now uh, and at the really this is really it's really a policy approach at this this point and it came out of uh, a couple of conversations most of which were driven by the fact we had an opportunity to talk to the, uh, the university deputy vice chancellors and a couple of other uh, uh, high level groups about just the costs of publishing um, 
and uh, particular subscriptions in Australia. So um, it, the cost, it, I could, if I was doing this in front of a live audience, I'd ask you to do some guesses, but the, the cost of subscriptions in Australia, are absolutely astonishing. It's $221 million a year. So that's about a quarter of what the ARC puts towards um, funding, actually funding research. I mean, it's an, it's an insane amount of money to be spending on subscriptions. Um, and when you start saying that type of thing to um, vice chancellors and deputy vice chancellors, they do actually listen for a little bit. So we had the opportunity to say to them, this is what's being spent and we need, we're not even, uh, we're spending that at the moment. We're also spending money on article processing charges, but that's really hard to, uh, to figure out exactly how much that is. And we still have, do not have access to most of the academic literature. So Linda O'Brien, who is the person who I mentioned before with ORCID, she pulled this working group together, which I was also part of, and uh, we developed a, what we call the FAIR statement. We did some, uh, end of last year, we uh, uh, did some cons consultation around it. It actually got held up slightly because of the election last year, which was an interesting example of what happens when you're trying to work in a political arena. Once an election's called, for example, and uh, you might remember it was an awfully long election last year, um, nothing happens. You know, you can't even have any conversation at all with anyone in federal government. Um, so that was it, but we did manage to draft it. Uh, we then decided, decided the next step was to uh, develop a fit steering group to figure out what was needed for implementation and that's where we are right now. And Jill Ben, who is the, uh, who's at UWA, has taken that on as the chair and I'm still part of it. And so this is the statement, um, which is up on our web and you're welcome to have a look and comment. And it's pretty, sh it's pretty short. The statement is, the entire statement is that on the left, which is that, uh, and we set ourselves a fairly aggressive time frame, which was by 2020, that Australian, all Australian publicly funded research outputs will be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then we go through and talk about the need to uh, do that through a range of appropriate models and also the need to support and incentivize academics to do that. Um, and then the, the, the other sort of little part of it which is um which is there is about ne needing a range of approaches and needing long-term nas com national commitment uh there's, there's you can read the statement just there and the other little parts to the other parts talk about the implementation and uh that's the next part of what we're trying to approach and this is not this is not out of line with what's happening globally i mean particularly with regard to data fair is you know exactly where everybody's going we're seeing FAIR used uh, in, in this particular uh, definition, which is the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for other research outputs. It's, FAIR is also used in, a, in a, um, a different way. You know, people talk about it when things as in being FAIR as in equitable. And that's, that, you know, I think that there are lots of different uses of the term, but for what we're talking about here, there are some really specific uh, items associated with each of these, uh, each of these words. And everything that we intend to do over the next, uh, you know, towards implementation will be towards um, opera, you know, making it clear what, what sort of operationalizing each of those. So this is what I would say at this point, a fair research output is. So for findable, the most important thing is having the really rich metadata. So uh, things such as, you know, the DOI for the article, the ORCID for the individual, um, and making sure that those are uh, uh, clearly there right from the beginning of a, um, a project. Accessible, obviously, it doesn't have to be via a, a, pub, a university repository. It could well be an OA journal or some other spot, but it's, uh, the, type, it's the permanent archive I talked about before uh, and accessible. Um, the interoperable bit is, is amazingly important and one that I think is probably what going to be the hardest bit probably to uh, to do for non-data. For data, in many ways, this is a sort of, it's more obvious what you do here. And the reusable bit is, is the license. Um, and uh, in this context, it's really important to say that the only licenses that we're recommending here are Creative Commons licenses. Um, there are many, many licenses out there, um, apart from public domain, but you know, create many, many licenses out there. You know, Elsevier helpfully made up, makes its own, makes up its own licenses. I even saw one from, I can't remember what it was, Wiley, I think came up with one the, one the other week. It's really unhelpful and should be pushed back on co constantly because every time you have a license that's not a standard one, it, it increases confusion amongst academics 
and you know there may well be something in it subtle that means that you can't actually do what you need to do with it so the creative commons licenses are, are what we're pushing very uh, consistently um and then uh, i mean you, you, you as a group are probably more familiar that this with there's some others that i talk about but the point i make is that actually we've got a lot of this in place at the moment so this is one of my favorite uh, sets of data from from qt it's the um it's the genome of a of, the, of some bugs from penguin feces down in the Antarctica, which shows delightfully that we are contaminating the Antarctic with our own feces, <laughs> and it's and it's turning up in the um in that of the penguins. But there you go. So this was a QUT PhD project, and um, so you you can see that this guy's got an orchid ID. Actually, it's not on his paper, but I managed to find it because after he published, um, I just went in and looked for him, and and he does indeed have an orchid ID, and all these papers are linked to it. Um, yeah, we've got the DOIs, uh, we've got Crossmark, which tells us which version of the paper we're looking at. Um, we've got the Creative Commons license, that's actually on all the articles, and we've got the Crossref, so it's all linked together. So we, we have within us, we have, you know, with many, within many institutions, actually what's there needed to make this happen, but it's not done, it's not linked together in any systematic way. Um, QUT is a sort of an exemplar of a really good repository where they put a lot of effort into making sure things are well tagged, but I would say that's, that's not a consistent issue across Australia. Um, so where are we now? So uh, we have the steering group members uh, agreed, so Jill's chairing it, I'm on it. Uh, we have folk from the Departments of Education, Training and Innovation and Science, ARC and NHMRC, um, Adrian Barnett, who's a, a, a health services researcher at QUT is on it. Uh, Tim Cahill is there, uh, not really for his KPMG experience, but because he used to be at the conversation and before that was actually also worked in, uh, uh, in managing era. So he's quite, quite familiar with the higher education landscape. And then we have representatives from uh, librarians. Uh, we're also looking to get some more uh, representations from a couple of other groups. And our intention is to try and nut out what are the next steps really for uh, operationalizing this because it's quite a big thing to do in one uh, in one go. So if you have a little bit of a think about what the what how you, what are the bits that you might need to do, we you can map it according to the various roles that uh, different groups have. So there's the institutions, researchers, yeah, funders clearly have a role, government has a role. But just to I'll just talk about a couple. Um, well, I'll talk about a couple that are in red, but I want to talk about one. I'll just mention before I go on to that, the need about repositories. So for institutions, one really, really key role is around the role of their repository. And Australia is actually in a rather good position because all institutions here do have a repository. However, they're not interlinked in any meaningful way. They're certainly not, um, you know, they're incredibly inconsistent in the way that things are tagged within them. And one of the pieces of work that I'm doing with uh, Natasha Simons from ANS is to uh, we've pulled together a group where we're hoping to, uh, we've done some basic work on what are the minimum requirements for interoperability with regard to the metadata that items need to have within them. So that I think is a, a sort of big chunk of work, one that's, that's quite important. Um, but with regard to the, the I don't, there's two bits that I think we can, you can begin to see what the next steps might be. So um, the first one, when I talked about the findable, that's the bit, that's the orchid bit really, is the most critical bit. And again, we've sort of done this, you know, in, at least the, the um, approach is more or less there. So uh, this is the orchid, uh, site of the orchids consortium for, or uh, for orchid. Um, and I really like the model of it because, you know, we have a global framework, which is this not-for-profit global organization, which is orchid. We have a national infrastructure that is there and in place and well-managed. Um, which requires money, you know, so this is the sort of thing that institutions actually do have to pay to fund. And I think that's an important principle for them to understand. Um, and that, but once it's done for the academics and they've got their orchid ideas, it's all pretty frictionless. So once you've done it and signed up and done it right, that's it. You've done your job as an academic. You don't have to do much else. That's really important. Um, and so the, another big approach that we are thinking or looking at very closely is the idea of having, um, what's called a, UK, a whole approach to licensing. And this is being really driven by a piece of work that's gone on in the UK by Chris Banks and colleagues at University, sorry, Imperial College London. And the idea would be that it makes it e easier than not for academics to have a license, a version, a license on a version of their work that they can share. Because right now, um, even if you publish, if you publish in a non-open access journal, if you want to publish in a, um, 
uh, if you want to then deposit a copy of that in your repository, the author accepted manuscript, first of all, it's pretty hard to do that. And secondly, you often don't have the rights or the, you know, the um, publisher would say that you don't have the rights. And so this is an attempt to have a national policy on that, whereby every, um, every institution in the UK will enact a policy which uh, retains the rights to uh, publish a version of an article within their, in their own repository. And it's being driven by researchers, uh, uh, by funders and uh, institutions in particular. And the aim is again here to have a sort of frictionless process for academics. And that if need be, they don't change their publishing habits because we know that's a big issue. Um, and so it's modeled on the, UK, on the Harvard model open access policy, which has been around for quite some time now. It's used by uh, 60 institutions from very small ones up to Harvard and MIT. The author retains the copyright, but grants the institution a non-exclusive right to deposit a copy of the author accepted manuscript with a CC, Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial license in the repository and they can still publish where they choose to publish. Um, journals can seek a waiver for this, academics can seek a waiver for this. Um, this has generally happened at less than 5%, but um, that's partly because this hasn't been a global process and what we're actually, what they are beginning to find in the UK is this has now, is now being not so much rolled out, but it's, uh, the publishers are aware of it, is the publishers are threatening to seek very high waiver rates. They're threatening to seek sort of 95% waiver rates. We remains to be seen what will happen if they do that or if they actually will do it. Um, but it's an, again, it's an interesting example. You know, you've got you've got the global framework, you've got national infrastructure, and the idea is for academics, it becomes a frictionless thing for them to to do. Um, and in Australia, where uh, the university librarians are exploring the feasibility of doing this here. Um, so this is my last slide. It's just the, the way just trying to get people to think about it. You know, it's this idea that we've got these objects that we know what they are. We know who produced them. They've got the reduced light rights. They're in a format that isn't just a PDF or a piece of paper, God help us. And um, that they're all well linked to the various um, other parts of the data and research life cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the themes for Open Access Week this year was open in order to be able to participate in global research and that's one of the ways that is quite it's quite a good way of getting the attention of senior academics and senior administrators in Australia because they're all desperate to get the research sort of um, globally uh, recognized and such like. So I think that's the end yep and uh, happy to hear any thoughts on it. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm interested in your view, I mean I've got a lot of questions, but your view of what networks like ours, how we can help the cause, because I guess we're kind of grassroots, we work with researchers and students, uh, not necessarily policy makers in institutions, but we may. Um, what, what's your view on, on what we can do to help all of this along? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, I think that I think, you know, for any real change to happen, it has to come from from three directions. So it has to come from the top. There actually does have to be will to do this. And I mean, one of the, for example, if I actually am um, in the piece that I wrote for the conversation, which I apologize is really kind of dumbed down because it, you know, it's not intended for people who, who <laughs> across all this stuff. But the idea is, you know, the big, big change really happens when somebody says, I'm going to put $5 million behind this to make various of these projects happen over the next you know, three years, come back and tell us when you've done it. So that, I think there is an absolute need for that. But on the other hand, what really helps is when researchers are in the ears of their DVCRs or their university librarians and saying, you know, I really want to make my research open, but you know, I don't seem to be able to get a DOI through your repository for my, uh, my data set or you know, there's no recognition for my software, or um, you know, what are you doing about making sure that uh, you know, the right licenses are associated with things? And I've heard this approach that is being talked about, which is fair, and I'd really like to know what the university's doing about it. It's a question of just you know, making them hear the words time and time and time again. So disseminating stuff that we publish I mean is really helpful every time there's um, there was a huge amount of well I hope people saw the activity around OA week but that was you know there's a deliberate push to try and get that onto people's um, 
Twitter streams and whatever. If you can just disseminate anything like that that you think is useful, you know, saw this article in the conversation, it'd mm -hmm. be great to pass it on. We've, that's much more effective than it coming from an external person. Um, I think the other thing that I also, um, and you know, as I say, because we're such a small advocacy group, I do have to kind of focus what I do. But uh, one of the things that we have done this year is we've done webinars on uh, throughout the year. Have you, have you been to any of them, Jeff? Uh, uh, I've been to one, yes. Okay. We did, we did everything from uh, one which was on, uh, actually from New Zealand, which was about academics views on open access. We had another one which was on um, uh, uh, incentives for openness. We had a really great one from Heather Joseph last week talking about the advocacy work she's doing, a whole range of views on open access. So again, those types of things, if they can be disseminated, that's really helpful um, because I feel that that's a good way of getting across what the issues are. But if you want to, we are now looking for, our, for people for next year. And I'm thinking that one thing I would particularly like to do is to have more case studies um, to be able to demonstrate, you know, different aspects of it. So if you have researchers or, and if you would like to do a webinar, then that would be tremendous. We'd be very keen to have that. Um, Philip or Matt, do you have any questions? I've got a few more. It's, yeah, I got a question. Um, is there any work being done to link all these, um, all these university repositories on a national level better? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, uh, yes, on a small scale. So there's, so the one thing that happened, the thing that happens already is, is um, the National Library. Um, there is a, it all, things do get fed into that. However, that is not the mechanism that's going to be workable globally. And, you know, it's, the National Library is not really set up to do research in it. Now, if there was somebody from the National Library, they'd probably kill me if I said that. But I mean, it is true. It's not that. That's not really what its primary purpose is. So the piece of work that we that needs to happen is um, we've had lots of there's lots of groups um, th that are working on this. The most important one is something called CORE, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And in fact, if you go back to my slides, which you're welcome to take, um, it, it's listed very early on. Uh, and they have done, they're doing some work around interoperability because they've absolutely identified, you know, the issue of interoperability and harvesting as being really critical. Um, but to do that, everybody has to have their items in the repository in the same format, tagged with the same metadata. Well, it's not the same format, but tagged with the same metadata. And we don't have that in Australia. So this repository working group that I was telling you about, that's the first piece of work that we're trying to do. And Open Air have said they are absolutely open to having... Um, to having an Australian feeding into them. We've just got to be able to deliver the content to them. Then absolutely, they're not interested in having, you know, UWAs separately from QUT, separately from UQs. But if we can develop it all into one place where it can sort of feed through a single pipeline, then they are interested in that. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I got one short question. You mentioned shortly that the ARC system and the ORCID system may be linked in a year or two. How does that look exactly? Will, will, just your, your, will it pull in your, your publications from the ORCID system automatically? That's the intention. Yeah, that's my understanding. And the ARC know that that's a hugely painful, painful point. Um, but there is actually already, um, do you, this uh, Adrian Barnett, who is, um, he's a, actually he's on our working group for FAIR, he's, he's pull together a little script which can actually pull your work already. I'll, I'll, I'll get a, let me see if I get linked to it and I'll put it in the, um, uh, um, in, in the chat room. Because yes, they, they recognize it's a huge pain point. Mm -hmm. I was being a little, little disingenuous when I said that you don't have to do anything once you've, uh, once you've got your orchid. That's not quite true because I think you do probably have to go in and just make sure it doesn't pick up duplicates. I mean, I don't, if, you had a, if you had an orchid early on, I, I had an orchid pretty early on and I manually entered a whole load of stuff. When you then get you know, them ha being populated automated, automatically, some stuff got duplicated. And in fact, it still happens because some comes from PubMed Central and some comes from Scopus. So you do kind of have to curate it a bit. Um, but yeah, but the intention is to be able to populate it. Okay, that would be so useful. Thank you. It would be fantastic. I mean, it's just insane that you... Know, so much work. <laughs> I know. Can I ask a question, Virginia, about ORCID ID? Uh, yeah. 
I've always found it quite clunky. You know, Google Scholar will find, you know, your latest publications really, you know, a few days after they go online. Whereas with Orchid, it seems like I've just logged in now and it's like, oh, my most recent publication is from March last year. It's like, oh, well, fortunately, I have a few since then. Um, is it something that kind of is meant to update itself or you really have to go to the trouble of um, making sure when you put in your, you know, you make your submission to the journal, you put your Orchid in then? It should, yeah. So, yes, it should update automatically. And if it isn't, it may well be because the um, the journal has not got the right um, is not doing their, their job properly. They're not all doing it properly yet. So um, it, sh it oh, I've done something funny. Did I just, uh, uh, um, yeah, it should update, but if it doesn't, that's the reason. And um, I, I, I sort of say to people, it's worth actually, um, if you have stuff that you think is problematic, just letting them know. Um, it's, uh, it's not a perfect system by any means. So I've just put in here the thing that's, um, that uh, Adrian developed. I can actually say that the orchid, the orchid guys are incredibly responsive because when I, I set up my orchid IG when I was in a, in a previous role, in a previous institution, and then when I moved here, I, I wanted to update it, and I have to say they were a pretty impressive. Um, so it is a, it is a pretty well managed service, I would say. Yeah, I remember doing what you said, Ginny, and you, you know, manually put some in, but then you just lose the will to do that yeah. pretty quickly, and I haven't done it for a while. And I just noticed like, yeah, I don't know how you keep it up to date. It seems well, quite, uh, yeah. I, and, and I would actually say, don't do it. Don't. Oh, so, well, the other thing you can do is if you, have you made sure your Scopus ID is linked? So there's a few linkings that need to happen. If your orchid ID is linked to your Scopus, then it will automatically update it. Anything, anything is indexed in Scopus. Oh, okay. That's probably the, that's the best thing to do. Or, you know, I mean, I didn't, I never generated a Scopus ID but it gener one got generated for me. And if you go into your orchid, what it'll say is um, who put it in. And essentially what is, what's happening now is that people are tending to want to have content that's pulled in from trusted sources. So for example, you know, if you're a QUT researcher, they'll verify that you're a QUT researcher rather than you putting it in. So uh, there should be virtually no manual entry of orchid at this point needed once you've linked everything. Another thing I wanted to mention is one of my favorite types of article are the kind of data articles yeah. that some journals now take. So there's like genomics data, scientific data, where you can really explain the data, explain the analysis and ideally provide some scripts for the analysis and, and, uh, and, and hope that people will find it more valuable by being able to download it and, and read, you know, run what you've run and then, uh, and, and make it more reusable. So I know for genomics, that's, you know, there are journals for those things, but maybe for other fields, they kind of lag behind a bit. And uh, it means yeah. you can sort of make, you know, make potentially, I like the model of if people generate data and they can then make it available straight away and then the publication will come later, but hopefully um, other people can, can get value from it early on too. So that, that's exactly right. And, you know, one of the key pieces of, uh, incentivizing people to share was to make sure there were really really good data sharing um that really good principles for citation for data because i mean it sounds really silly i mean i haven't come from a journal editors can obsess over anything believe me i mean you wouldn't believe how long it took to decide how to um how to properly cite a twitter a tweet i mean but many many people's hours went into that but anyway it is important to cite data properly because, you know, with data sets evolving in particular, you know, which version of it you, are you citing and, you know, are you citing the code associated with it? So there's a group called, um, uh, well, there's lots of groups working this, but uh, Force 11 came up with the original FAIR principles and they've done other work on data. Um, and actually, is it Force 11 that did the data citation or is that RDA? I'm looking at... You data know, site. Data site. Okay, that's right. So it, because... If you can't get credit for it, people won't do it systematically. So um, I, one thing I do say to people is if you're sharing your data sets, for goodness sake, make sure that they are can, they can be properly cited um, and that you know that that's been done in a, in a correct way. And part of that is making sure it's in a repository that knows how to curate it properly. Um, the other thing that was mentioned at e-research, which was really interesting, was so they had... Um, 
keynote speaker on the last day, whose name is just escaping me, um, talked about the need to have proper ways to cite software as well, which is in the past has not been well uh, uh, done. I can't remember his name now, Jess is going to remember it in a minute. Um, <laughs> and, and, and now there are journals which, where, where you can essentially just, um, you know, put up your software with a short description of it and get a proper citation to it in the same way that you used to be able to. So that's equally important. Um, what you do find is that if you share data sets, they get many more citations than original articles. So that's, that's something to be able to say to people once... Uh, yeah, once you've got, got it up there in a good format. Yes, that, that guy was uh, um, Daniel Katz. That's right, Daniel Katz. And his talk was called Software in Research, Underappreciated and Underrewarded, which I would say is absolutely correct. It was a fabulous talk and it's up on, it, that's up on uh, somewhere or the other, isn't it? On the web, yeah. On the web, yeah. Um, I just, I guess I had a couple of comments and, and I was interested, in, and, and you've talked about a global scholarly ecosystem. So I think it's really important to think in that way. And it's not just the responsibility of publishers. It's not just the responsibility of the universities. For this audience, it's really important that we build national infrastructure or pin into national infrastructure, which is then hooked into international infrastructure that just allows all this stuff to happen. So make it easy for people to publish data, make it easier for people to publish tools or if they're using a platform, workflows from that platform um, and so on and so forth. So, and certainly, you know, I know that you have, you've had a lot of discussions with ANS and the, the latest round of ANS and NECT and RDS funding, which funds a lot of data infrastructure is very heavy on demonstrating that there will be a, I guess, an increasing maturity in the fair data principles for all these things. So I think that's really good news. Yeah. I mean, I mean our, our difficulty at the moment is that um, data is, in Australia, data is quite well supported. And, you know, ANS is just an example of that. When the, the um, national frame, one of the last framework came out, there was, you know, there's this Australian Science Cloud, which is obviously a large amount of money is going into, and we advocated for it to include research publications and other outputs as well, and it didn't happen. And I, I think it's a really fundamental missed opportunity. So ironically, what you know, ANS and Nectar and RDS are quite well funded, and you know, organisations like mine are not, because it, I, I don't know, for somehow people, I mean, there's all sorts of politics around, you know, budgets and such like, and why, why this is happening from a political point of view, but I, I also think there's just a real lack of, um, oh, just a real lack of, you know, a, a long-term vision, I think. And uh, I think that's quite frustrating, allied with the fact that the publishers, you know, do a vast amount of lobbying to, um, to support their business model. And I know this is being recorded by, I've said that in public, public plenty of times. In fact, somebody came up to me after my talk at your research from Elsevier. <laughs> So there you go. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess I just also had a, a sort of a comment, I guess. So I was really pleased to hear that you've been talking to the ARC and NHMRC and that the policies are going to mention licences. But then I was sort of thinking during your talk about, you know, what are the... Sometimes the blockers to people adopting something can be very simple. And I think, I mean, policies are great, but policies rarely are... Um, point to saying, for instance, we want you to use a, an example license, like a Creative Commons license. And, and I know that the UK scholarly license website, I was looking at it as well. It's, it's to a non-initiated person, it can be quite difficult to work out what they're getting at, instead mm -hmm. of saying, just use this license. And then kind of the, the conversation's over. So did you, you know, the policy is great. Do you know if, you know, ARC and HMRC, for instance, would, would ever say, and here are some examples we would prefer you to use for licences? Well, that, like that, that. That, that's what the ARC does say. So they, they now say, they say that their preferred licence is CC by Perfect. CC by. Right. However, they know, I mean, we all know that that's really hard. And in fact, it's highly unlikely that most 
um, people will, will be able to do that. But I mean, I think with all of these policies, the idea is that you, you know, you change people's minds about what's acceptable, mm. and then you know, accepting that probably for the next few years, not everybody's going to be able to comply. But then maybe when the next version of it comes around, you know, people have been doing it for long enough that it is actually, you know, more likely than not they will make something available CC by. Um, it, there are certainly, I mean, the Wellcome Trust, for example, is what, yeah, what says, for example, if we pay an APC, it will be CC by. There is no, nothing else or, or, you know, you know, CC zero or whatever. They will not accept anything less. That, that's a straight financial transaction. And I mean, that is something that funders can do pretty easily, actually. The, Wellcome, the Gates Foundation does the same. There isn't, they're not, not, nothing else is acceptable. If they pay an APC, that's what you get. Yeah. The scope three, I didn't have a chance to talk about scope three. Scope three is my favorite. Well, I, I'm, I'm very fond of it. It's, this is the um, sponsoring consortium for open access publishing in particle physics, which is coordinated by CERN. Um, and they manage the model. They, ma they basically pay for article processing charges through a consortial model. And the deal is that if the publisher does not get the article into the scope repository within 24 hours of publication, fully open access with all the required metadata and licenses, they don't get paid. Mm. Guess what their compliance rate is? 99.9%. Like .9 yeah. It's really simple. Sense. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you. Um, that's been fantastic. Um, so thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, so I'll, there's a few people that couldn't make this. I'm recorded it and I'm sure they'll all be uh, having a look at it. And, uh, yeah, something I forgot to mention at the beginning was that um, Emble ABR has been invited to participate in the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group Advisory and Engagement Board. So I think that's really good news. Um, so we will be participating in this conversation and, and using this group to sort of as a conduit for exchange information backwards and forwards. So Great. thank you for the invitation and thank you for joining us today. And uh, yes, we shall Excellent. speak. I will show you my, um, before we go, I'll show you my Emble platypus, which is on my desk. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I've got one too. <laughs> thanks okay. a lot, Ginny. All right, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thanks.